All right, you guys, welcome to my YouTube live. My name is Michelle Hearn. I'm a registered and licensed dietitian as well as an ultra runner. And you guys, I am super excited today. Today I have Dr. Ken Berry, who really needs no introduction. So Dr. Berry, thank you so much for, uh, for joining me today. No, it's always a pleasure, Michelle. Uh, I, I never tire of having intellectual conversation. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I love that we can talk about just... I mean, I feel like you and I could probably talk for hours just on the state of food and how things are going. And it's uh, I continue to be, you know, go back and forth. I continue to be encouraged in certain aspects of how things are going. You know, when I hear more, um, we're having more low carb papers, we're having more advocacy. And then I go to the grocery store and I continue to be a little bit discouraged. So, um, yeah, you know, just really, really briefly for anybody on my channel, I can't imagine there's anybody who doesn't know who you are, but would you just give the kind of quick Reader's Digest version of who you are and what you do? Yeah, I'm Dr. Ken Berry. I am a licensed family physician. Uh, I've been practicing for 21 years now, and uh, I have more and more redirected my practice to recommending a, what I call a proper human diet, which is a very low carbohydrate diet, a very nutrient dense diet, a diet made up of foods that we've been eating for at least 50,000 years, if not a lot longer, uh, using the same methods of preparing that food that we've used for 50,000 years or longer. And so I think that's where our best health lies, just like any mammal. Yeah, there is a absolutely. Diet that is specific for our species. And I don't really think that's arguable at all. As long as you eat it within that proper human diet spectrum, good health, optimal health will be yours. And that doesn't mean perfect health. We're all gonna have things that go wrong from time to time, but the, 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 the frequency with which things go wrong and the severity of which things go wrong are gonna be much less when you're eating a proper human diet, just like any other mammal on the planet, if you feed them a diet that's not species specific, they're going to get sick. They're going to get fat. They're going to get type two diabetes. They're going to get fatty liver. But if you feed them a diet that, that is the same diet that their species has been eating for a million years, then they will have just automatically have optimal health without even trying. Yeah. I, I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, you know, I was thinking I was, I had to do, you know, as a dietitian, I'm required to do 75 um, hours of continuing education every, it's, it's not bad. It's like every, um, every five years, but depending on where you live, you know, it's, um, it's different per state. So I'm licensed based in Oregon and Washington. I kind of live right on the border and Oregon requires 15. And so of course, you know, I'm getting to the end. I'm like, ah, I got to do something. And a lot of the continuing educations that are approved for, you know, my organization aren't necessarily things that I, I like, but I found a book that I was pretty interesting. Um, and it did have some studies in there. You know, it, it really, it really is interesting to me when we talk about type two diabetes and, you know, type two diabetes is obviously increasing exponentially. And the fact that some people think that it has to do with meat or saturated fat, or that is a confounding factor is really just bizarre. Have you heard that that argument? And do you, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and you virtually will always hear this from someone who believes in their heart that a plant based diet is is the best diet. Mm -hmm. uh, vegans love to say that that uh, saturated animal fat causes type two diabetes, but I mean any doctor or dietitian with any kind of common sense rationality is going to immediately know that's foolishness. That's just dumb. That's like saying, oh, if you breathe too much air, you'll get type 2 diabetes. <laughs> you know, we've been eating fatty red meat for almost as long as we've been breathing air. Yeah. And so it, it's, it's kind of silly on its face. But there are many people out there who don't know any better. They, they, they respect that guru, that influencer. And they're like, oh, OK, fat meat causes diabetes. Got it. Uh, I'll remember that. And so I call this the echo of the lie because no rational, reasonable doctor or dietitian actually says that anymore. But the echo of the lie is still out there in the community. And so you may mm -hmm. hear it from your mom or your brother-in-law, even though no, no rational dietitian has been saying that for a long time. There was a study years ago that showed that uh, indeed cells that are more insulin resistant have more fat stored in them. And so they made the illogical jump that, oh, so since there's fat in those cells, 
eating fat must make the fat join those cells. Yeah. Therefore, yeah, it makes that. the cells more insulin resistant, right? And that's just that's not even how human physiology works at the at the most basic level. And so any any healthcare provider that's still repeating that is full of crap, basically. Uh, they're, they either have something to sell or they have an agenda that does that has nothing to do with your optimal health. Yeah, I think you made a really good point. And this is something that I worry we've kind of stopped doing in society is I always encourage my listeners, people following me is critically think, ask questions. If something doesn't make sense, you know, it's you should ask questions in your doctor, dietitian, somebody should be able to give you a good answer. You know, and if you're asking for something as specific as like, look, I don't know if this, you know, right now, the current treatment for diet, er, the dietitians prescribe for diabetes is a consistent carbohydrate diet, meaning I'm going to give you 75 to 90. I saw in the hospital up to 130 grams of carbohydrates per meal, not per day, per meal, yep. um, and then dose you with insulin. And I was, you know, I was talking with a, a friend of mine and I said, you know, we, we would, we wouldn't do that with anything else. Like if you can imagine that you're, um, you know, you're lactose intolerant. I wouldn't say, okay, I'm going to give you three glasses of milk and a lot of lactase enzyme three times a day, or you had a massive infection. Like, let's say you had a bacterial infection on your arm. I wouldn't say, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to dump a lot of bacteria in that and then smother it with antibiotics. I'm going to try to remove what's causing the problem. In the case of, car you know, diabetes, I now have a carbohydrate intolerance. You know, it's not debatable. And yep why am I giving you more carbohydrates? So, yep. and, and this, this kind of advice is pervasive and it's so confusing to people. I just posted a TikTok. Yes, mm -hmm. Michelle, I'm on TikTok. You're on TikTok. Someone told me I had to get on TikTok. Yeah, you got to get on TikTok. And it was a WikiHow article, which is a very popular website. People go there to get questions answered. And the, and the question was, how do you lower your A1C? And so it, it literally out of 11 steps, it said things like, weigh and measure your uh, food portion size. It's like, okay, that has nothing to do with lowering A1C. Uh, drink more water. Mm -mm. I mean, if that's you drink five idea. gallons, you might, you know, some, that still wouldn't do it. That wouldn't lower your, it has nothing to do with it. Uh, and then one of them was said, eat a plant-based diet. And it's like, that's pure carbohydrates. How is that ever going to lower your A1C, right? But so if you if you converted from a, a, a Dorito and Ding Dong diet, drinking and washing it all down with Pepsi and you switch from that to a plant-based diet, you might lower your A1C one oh, or sure. two or three tenths of a percentage point, but never on a plant-based diet. If you are metabolically unwell, you're never going to have a normal A1C. And then uh, tip number seven was try a ketogenic diet. And I was like, yeah, let's, let's just skip the rest of them. Yeah. Can we skip? <laughs> Maybe we should start in September. Yeah, you know, the, one of my biggest issues with plant-based diets, and I really appreciate that when you came on my Instagram live, you said, you know what, vegans, I can respect that they're at least like looking for the truth because yep. I can be hard on vegans and veganism sometimes. Vegans are not, sometimes they're not the nicest people when they come at me at social media. <laughs> they can be very dogmatic, but they are they they are trying, right? And, and what happens often, and I saw this uh, in the hospital, and I especially saw this with women, is like, like you said, they're going from a diet where I'm just, I'm stressed. I'm eating a lot of processed food, a lot of sugary drinks. And when I remove that processed food and all of a sudden, instead of ding dongs and Pepsi, I'm having smoothies and apples. Well, I'm going to feel better. You know, I'm, I'm getting rid of the processed food, but yep. what happens is it's not, it doesn't last long and you're missing out on so many of the nutrients, you know, because as you and I know, and we've talked about so much, you know, meat is not just protein. You know, because if that was true, then you could just get a protein powder and it would be one and the same. You know, meat is it's all those cofactors. That's how we developed as humans. And when I say cofactors, I'm talking about things like B12, folate, iron, things that our cells need to grow and to thrive. And um, yeah, I just find it so interesting that, <laughs> you know, that's also still a big argument that, yes, maybe we should embrace a plant-based diet and you know that the documentary that came out um a couple i guess it was a couple years ago the game changers i still get asked about that yep. and you know they said meat was inflammatory and meat could cause all these problems and you know if you back up the person who you know was the director of that film james cameron who's you know best known for the titanic and for uh, i think terminator him and his business partner had you know multi-million dollars in plant-based foods Yep. And so I think that's a great example, Michelle. The Game Changer movie was an excellently made, right? Mm -hmm. It was every bit as good cinematically as Titanic. 
And it was also filled with just as much fiction as Titanic. <laughs> and so I think everybody needs to understand just because somebody made a compelling, beautifully made movie, uh, it, most movies that are beautiful and compelling are pure fiction. And, yeah. and The Gang Changer is a movie just like that. It's a beautiful movie. I enjoyed watching it very much. But it's full of misinformation, full of fiction, just like all of James Cameron's other movies. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there's one thing that I think is interesting that I um, was looking at because, you know, they, they actually did a study. They did a study with teenage, actually obese teenage boys, and they fed them three breakfasts um, and they had them overnight in this place. So they had fasted. And the breakfast was either um, an equal portion of either instant oatmeal and uh, or uh, steel cut oats or an omelet with fruit. And as you and I, and you know, most people watching this will can probably would probably guess the instant oatmeal, you know, their blood sugar went incredibly high. Insulin went incredibly high. They had a much more steady release with the um, with the, the steel cut oats because of the fiber, but they still had a blood glucose and an insulin response much, much less with the, you know, with the omelet and fruit because you're getting that fat and protein. Yep. But one thing that I don't know if we talk enough about, and I thought this was interesting, and I think I want to do a post on this, is when we eat those processed foods, when we eat the, um, you know, the instant oatmeal, and the things that are just, you know, maybe even considered healthy. Like a lot of people think like, oh, oatmeal, you know, the Quaker, it's on the go, it's great, it's good for me, um, is the, they also measure their adrenaline adrenaline for these boys went incredibly high yep. for up to four mm -hmm. hours. Yep. And, so, and so you can imagine what's that going to do to their anxiety level? Yeah. What's anxiety. To their aggression level. What's that going to do to their ability to sit still and focus for a long period of time? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. I mean, we know prescriptions um, for ADHD um, and, and even mental illnesses like, you know, and when I wrote my book, you know, I, I was really lucky to be able to talk to Dr. Chris Palmer and it's it's amazing how how mental health like we know, like I think everybody kind of knows like, OK, mental health is an epidemic in this country. But, you know, the, the number one cause of disability in this country, you guys, is depression. Yep. It's not cancer. It's not diabetes. It's not obesity. It, more people go do cannot go to work because of depression. And the type the amount is I think it's like 13 percent of the United States is on an antidepressant. And for our children. Bipolar disorder has increased 4,000% over the last decade. So, and you know, a lot, you, you always have the people coming out and saying like, oh, society sucks, everybody's on their phone. Potentially, yes. But, you know, what, I think when it comes down to it, we have to look at how we're eating and how we're eating is changing so rapidly. You know, and I had somebody tell me like, hey, Michelle, I feel like, haven't we always, didn't, didn't grandma and grandpa eat some bread and butter? Like, what is so different? We have never in society eating the amount of carbohydrates, specifically processed carbohydrates that we have. So we've increased those exponentially. And when I say processed carbohydrates, I'm talking like that instant oatmeal, that granola bar, those cookies, chips, you know. Um, and most people don't eat those, you know, once a week or once a month. They don't even eat them once a day. They're eating them three, four times a day. And remember just that one serving of oatmeal spiked that kid for four hours, their adrenaline. So we have that. And at the same time, instead of eating beef and saturated fat and getting all that, that um, satiation and nutrients, we're eating the vegetable oils and those vegetable oils. Can you speak a little bit about that, about the effects of vegetable oils on your, yeah. on your body? Yeah. And so it's, it's very well known in uh, paleology and paleoanthropology that the omega-3 to omega-6 ratio that humans consumed for 99.9% .9 of our time on this planet was an omega-6 to omega-3 of roughly one-to-one, -one, uh, may, maybe up to four-to-one, okay? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's uh, like I said earlier, if our ancestors weren't doing it 50,000 years ago, we probably shouldn't be doing it now because evolution doesn't move that fast. But now the average person eating the, the average, you know, takeaway, drive through junk food in the cardboard boxes, stuff they buy uh, in the inner part of the store, not the outer aisle, that stuff has a omega-6 to omega-3 ratio of 15 to 1. 15 to 1. Up to 30 to 1, depending on how much junk food you eat. And this, this huge preponderance of, of omega-6 to omega-3 looks like it's very, very inflammatory in the human body. Uh, all the all the all uh, these oils are very easy for them to go rancid. 
And if you're even going to consider eating them, you should buy them in a, in a very dark bottle. Like we still put olive oil in because uh, the olive oil makers know olive oil will go rancid if you just put it in a clear bottle. Well, so does canola and soybean and corn and peanut and safflower and sunflower and sesame oil. But they put those in clear containers so they can show you that beautiful golden color of the oil that they were able to achieve at the chemical factory after they they deodorized and put detergent in there and all kinds of chemical reactions to get it to not be look like sludgy mud to make it look nice and beautiful and golden and clear they want to show that off but in the process of light hitting that and any kind of heat including room temperature that oil is oxidizing very rapidly and and mm -hmm. that leads to inflammation in your body and not even to to mention the the inappropriate omega-6 to omega-3 ratio all that stuff together, plus everything you're not getting because you're not eating animal fat, you're eating vegetable fat instead. And there, there have been three very well-performed, controlled, long-term trials in humans that show without question that when you try to replace animal fat with plant, plant fat, People get sicker quicker. They die quicker. They have a higher rate of cancer. And uh, I've got a, I've got links to all three of those studies in my one of my YouTube videos about this. If you're like, no, there's no been no no, no control long term research in humans. Oh yes, my friend, there has. There's been three very well done studies: the Minnesota Heart Study, the Sydney Heart Study, and then there's one more. I, I can never remember the third one, but there's three studies that went for years in controlled fashion that show that it's absolutely clear. If you replace saturated animal fats with polyunsaturated fat uh, vegetable oils, people don't do as well. It's inflammatory and it's not healthy. That's amazing. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. I think it's interesting. I, I believe it was um, relatively recently, the um, American College of Cardiology had came out with their meta-analysis and basically in a very, um, what's a good word for this? Uh, oh, well, very careful statement basically said like, ooh, there's, there's actually not enough evidence to recommend people reduce saturated fat, like reduce meat and saturated fat. Like, and to me, I mean, it's that study. There's two There's two big meta-analysis and studies that I'm just shocked haven't got like more. Like to me, that's huge. That's like this big institution saying like, I mean, what they're really saying is like, holy crap, we really effed up. If people had been eating a lot more meat and fat and a lot less carbs, your, you know, mom and dad and you probably wouldn't have diabetes, you know. Exactly right. exactly. So and, and then when they came out with them. Um, they uncovered that I believe it was in the 1950s or, or 60s that two scientists, nutrition scientists from Harvard were paid. They were literally paid the equivalent of like $50,000 in today's dollars to um, throw a fat under the bus. The sugar industry was worried that because they were starting to see links between sugar and heart disease. And at that time, you know, in the in the 50s, it, you didn't have to disclose where funding is coming from. Now, in all research, all research studies, you do have to disclose like this is where we got our money. So, yeah, they basically, you know, kind of falsified cherry pick data. And then it came, you know, they published in two major journals, you know, and you had Ansel Keys and you had people very afraid of heart, you know, oh, my God, fat is bad. Uh, and and now that they've come out and have been like, oh, my God, look what we found. Why are we not seeing like a revolution? Why are we not seeing people say like, oh, my God. We need to eat more fat. We need to take the sugar out. I, um, you know, to me, giving people the advice that we should be eating all foods in moderation and all foods fit it, it is akin to saying, like, you know, you could smoke cigarettes in moderation. Like, it just, it, it just doesn't make sense. It's not, it's not helping anybody. It's not giving anybody any good, tangible information, right? And I think, I think more and more doctors and dietitians are waking up to that every day. Uh, you know, eat the rainbow, eat everything in moderation. That, those sound like very sage morsels of advice. But any thoughtful doctor or dietitian is going to go, yeah, but what does that actually even mean? How, how, in what way does eating all things in moderation? Sure, that's going to limit your intake of bad stuff, but you're still eating bad stuff. So mm -hmm. how is that OK? How am I how am I how am I defending my license? by saying it's okay to smoke a little crack. It's okay. To <laughs> Just don't go crazy with it. Right. Exactly. And, and another good example is cholesterol. And you can speak to this as a dietitian, the, sure. the dietary guidelines for Americans has very quietly stopped recommending a maximum intake of cholesterol in their, mm -hmm. in their latest guidelines. And used to, they said 300 milligrams a day max, any more than that is probably dangerous. Now they say, oh, cholesterol is not really a nutrient of concern. We don't we don't have a recommended maximum intake of cholesterol anymore. But the thing they didn't do 
because they didn't hold a press conference, Michelle. And in order to get rid of the echo and the lie out in society, you've got to have a press conference, a press release that says, hey, we got it wrong for 50 years and we're sorry about that. But as of now, the your federal government does not consider it dangerous if you eat high cholesterol foods. It is fine to eat egg yolks. It is fine to eat bacon. We cannot prove it's bad for you. So we've stopped telling you to limit your intake of it. But they didn't hold that press conference, did they, Michelle? No. And so no, now they you've didn't. Got, yeah, you've got your brother-in-law and you maybe even have your dietitian who's not paying attention, still saying, oh, don't eat shrimp and egg yolks and, and bacon. They're too high in cholesterol. But if any of you guys have a dietitian or a doctor say you shouldn't eat that, it's too high in cholesterol, they are five to 10 years behind in their reading. They are way, way behind the curve and, and they may very well be giving you dangerous advice. Yeah, I have very strong opinions about cholesterol. And I think when um, Dave Feldman's study comes out, I think we're going to have a little bit more clarity on this um, because, you know, there still is a huge correlation between people think that if you're if your cholesterol is higher, it's automatically bad for everybody. And it costs every, you know, um, and that's just not true. You know, and in my book, in my heart chapter, I cite several studies, some with up to 600,000 people, the higher their LDL cholesterol, the less they had infections, the less, the, the longer they lived. I mean, even one of the studies said like, yeah, we, we, sh we can't recommend lowering cholesterol or cholesterol lowering medications to people um, due to, <laughs> because of this data. And having worked in a hospital for a very long period of time, I'm sure, you know, as a doctor, Often, you know, once people's cholesterol gets above a certain number, you're supposed to recommend a statin. Absolutely. And and people listening might say, well, how are those studies not? I mean, the, the media should be blowing those studies up, talking about them. But you got to think about it. it. The Where did most people hear about the latest studies? They hear about them on their local news, right? Not even the, the, not the, the national news, but their local news channel say a new study sh is out showing that if you eat more than three egg yolks a day, it's like smoking five packs of cigarettes or some foolishness yeah. like that. But if they were to say the Channel 5 News in your local town said, you know, there's no, this new study shows there's no evidence that you should limit your saturated fat whatsoever. Well, guess who their advertisers are? Their sponsors that pay for the news to be put on TV. It's Crestor, right? It's Lipitor. It's uh -huh. Western Oil. It's, it's Betty Crocker, it's Nabisco, all these people who are making billions of dollars trying to keep people's cholesterol low, uh, their LDL cholesterol, and also trying to sell them foods that are low fat. So immediately they'd be getting phone calls saying, hey, we're going to pull all our ads. If you don't stop talking about that article, what do you think the average news co co company, which is a, their business, they try to stay yeah. and make a profit. If, if somebody's about to pull two thirds of their ad dollars, they're going to shut up about that story and never mention it again. Yeah. And that's unfortunate. I mean, there's a saying that like, be careful trying to explain something to somebody when their salary depends on them believing the opposite, you know, and that's certainly, um, you know, on my Instagram page today, you guys, if you, you can follow me at, at run, eat, meet, repeat. I, um, I recently lost a close friend, a college teammate, um, a year younger than me uh, to a three year battle with cancer, breast cancer. And, I have a hard time with um, some of the supplemental drinks, these insurers and boosts and things that we recommend. And I put a picture of it's called Boost Soothe. So it's specifically recommended for patients dealing with cancer. And I have two problems with it. One, I have seven, 17 tablespoons of sugar, 17. That's my obviously huge number one. My number two problem is if you flip over the back of the box, it says that it has less than four. I'm not tablespoons, I'm sorry, teaspoons. It says it has less than four teaspoons of sugar because they don't have to count brown rice syrup, which spikes your blood sugar higher than table sugar because it's a labeling loophole. So, you know, we're these basically, we're basically as doctors and dietitians, we're giving cancer patients a melted milkshake and we're yes. pretending we're pretending that it's a nutrition drink. It's somehow yes. going to improve or extend or prolong your life and it's literally a melted down milkshake from mcdonald's it's just a sugar milkshake yes exactly and people you know living in this this current time in history like i i truly can't think of you know i'm i'm 38 a time in history where it's more important to be healthy i feel like i've never seen in my lifetime you know people more afraid to just even go outside and breathe and I feel like we have missed a huge opportunity um, as public, certainly maybe not you and me and some of the low carb advocates, but 
teaching people like we have now we have studies we didn't when this first hat when the you know pandemic first started but if you are obese if you are diabetic you you are significantly more likely to suffer complications just like we were talking about at the beginning of this it, you're gonna you have more chance of being sick because you have more inflammation and oxidation in your body so how do you do that it is not complicated and that's one thing i love about this i feel like as dietitians when i started as a dietitian we made diabetes so complicated. Okay, you got to measure out all your portions, 75, dose with insulin, check your blood sugar. Are you too high? More insulin. Are you too low? More carbs, you know, all day long. Where what you need to do, Dr. Berry, and I'm sure you would agree, is let's get back to that proper human diet. Let's eliminate this. Let's get back to what humans need to eat and thrive because it's basically doing the opposite of everything you were taught. You know, we need that saturated fat. We need the meat. Those things will keep our energy and blood sugar nice and stable. And over time, they will restore you to health. And I think what the coolest thing about the proper human diet is, you know, when I say over time, I mean, we have clinical trials that somebody was actually able to get off 150 units of insulin. You guys, if you're not familiar, that's a pretty solid amount of insulin in eight days. Obviously, you need to be monitored by your doctor if you're going to be doing something like this, but it doesn't need to take you six months, a year, 10 years. It doesn't even necessarily need to take you a few months. Yep, you can completely right. restore your metabolic health and you can be like light years ahead of half of the population. Yep. You know, you can lose weight, you can get out of depression, you know? And I know these are really big claims, you guys, but like Dr. Barry and I have talked about before, like we see it all the time. Yeah, one, in fact, one of the uh, type two diabetics that we worked with on the docuseries Mm. We just in the course of seven days, we had she had to decrease her insulin pump by about 70 percent because that in just a few days of eating a very low carb, delicious, nutrient dense diet prepared by Maria Emmerich. Oh, cool. World famous keto chef and nutritionist. She, her she had to she had to literally almost turn her insulin pump off because she was getting hypoglycemic episodes because she was now on too much insulin as a type two diabetic because she was eating a very low carbohydrate diet. It's just that simple. Lower the carbs, you need less insulin. Repeat. And before long, as a type two diabetic, you can throw the insulin in the garbage. Hmm. I mean, I think that's probably has to be one of the most rewarding things as a, as a type two diabetic being like, I can get off this medication. I can reverse this medication because, yeah. you know, the type two diabetics that I've talked to and my, my nephew is a type one diabetic. He's 10. But, um, you know, especially when he was a little bit younger, you know, because he if you're not familiar, you guys with type one, like they don't actually make their own insulin. So if they're having carbohydrates, they have to take exogenous. They have to um, stick themselves or, you know, um, he could go hypoglycemic. He could go low just when he was out running around or playing. And that's hard, you know, for a little kid. And insulin is incredibly expensive. It is not, um, you know, if you're able to reduce your insulin, it's. It's a it's a good thing all around. So, yeah, tell us a little bit more about this docu-series, because I think this is something that needs to be like blasted out. And it's very you guys, it's very easy to get. Um, let me I'll let you tell uh, everyone about it. Yeah. So we me and Maria Emmerich and uh, our producer, Charles Maddox, we flew four people with some degree of, of uh, type two diabetes from prediabetes all the way up to just severely uncontrolled type two on insulin pump. Flew them to Costa Rica for the for the ambiance and the beautiful scenery down there. It's it's gorgeous, and we spent seven days living in a house together. It was a mm -hmm. nice house, and we had our meals prepared by Maria Emmerich, and we just sat around and we talked about how you can reverse type two diabetes with a ketogenic diet plus intermittent fasting. And uh, Dr. Jason Fung made a couple of remote guest appearances, and he he gave information and answered questions that the house guests had. And like I said, we had another uh, house guest who was on three different blood pressure medications. And, and just in the seven days he was there, we had to stop one. Wow. Because seven days, was, you guys. Yeah. His blood pressure was already getting so low that when he stood up, he would get lightheaded because he didn't need that much anymore. Because once you diurese from, from your insulin returning to normal, you don't need as much blood pressure medication. And I, now he's either on a low dose of one blood pressure pill so he stopped two and decreased the dosage of the third one. And he may even be completely off blood pressure medicines at this point. 
Uh, Lisa, the severe type two, she's uh, using uh, just the tiniest amount of insulin now. Any day now, she'll be completely off the insulin. Uh, and, and then our other two have, have lost, continued to lose weight and reverse their hemoglobin A1C back to completely normal. Mm-hmm. And there, there are still doctors and dietitians out there who do not believe it's possible to reverse type two diabetes, even though the American Diabetes Association, did you see this, Michelle? They came yeah, I've seen that now they're even saying like- They're you- saying, <laughs> yes, you can put type two in uh, diabetes in remission. That's what they call it, remission. But we don't know how to do that yet. They literally said that in their position paper. And it's like, uh, why don't you uh, shoot me a DM? I'll, I'll hook you up. Yeah, I'll exactly. I'll tell you what to fill in the blanks there so you can help people actually do it. And it makes people question the AEA. It's like, what the hell are they doing? If yeah. this is common knowledge that you can do this now, it's becoming common knowledge, yeah. then why aren't they holding that press conference, Michelle? Why aren't they literally inviting every major network and, 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 and come to Washington? We're going to have this huge press conference. We're going to reveal a huge secret that the world needs to know. 88% of people in the United States are metabolically unwell. They have at least one marker of metabolic syndrome. Yeah. But we wanted to tell you, if you'll eat a low carbohydrate diet, you can reverse virtually every one of those and you can reverse type two diabetes too. Thus saith the American Diabetes Association. But for some reason, they're dragging their feet on holding that press conference. I'm not sure why. You know, unfortunately, maybe because I'm a bit jaded with having a, you know, dealt with <laughs> my profession as a dietitian and we have, you know, our corporate sponsors. You know, I shared with you one of our corporate sponsors is the National Confectionery Association. You guys oh. are literally sponsored by candy. Uh-huh. Um, also, Gorilla Pasta is one oh. of our sponsors. OK, uh, so, uh, what is your official body, uh, your regulatory body? What's it called? I've always forget. The Academy the of Nutrition. Academy, yeah, of think it's an Academy of Nutrition and Diet. It used to be the American Dietetics Association. Right. Um, and then it went to the Academy of Nutrition. And then I believe okay. now it's the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. Yeah. Um, so you're saying, what you're saying is then indirectly is that if the Academy of Nutrition held a press conference and said, you guys need to eat a low carbohydrate diet. If you're pre-diabetic, type 2 diabetic, if you have LADA, if you're a type 1 diabetic, you need to eat a low carbohydrate diet. You're saying that you suspect that they might lose their million dollar check from the pasta company and from the confectionery sugar companies. You think they might lose that those millions of dollars? Yeah. Well, and the number one sponsor is Abbott, who makes Insure, you know, oh, so that insure, is, that's the corporate is the corporate gold sponsor. Which is we were talking about earlier. Yes. So they might lose that million dollar check as well. Exactly. Oh, okay. I, it's it's making more sense to me. <laughs> yeah. So it's like you're going to and, and and because of this, because because we continue to um, say the you know give people these boosts and the sugar and all things in moderation, we continue to see a population that gets sicker and um, not just physically but mentally, it has more and more problems. And so, in my opinion, then we develop other nonsense with saying like. Well, I guess, you know, it's just maybe every maybe a little extra weight is fine for everybody. Like I hear things like that all the time, like, well, as you get older, you just get fatter. And well, it's just normal as you get older to not be able to move around as well. And I'm like, you know, as you pointed out earlier throughout history, you know, we're looking at like like archaeology. We have evidence, you know, skeletal fossils, people hunted fish, you know, up until the like 90s, hundreds, like yeah, the human body is designed to, to move and to function very well into old age when it's taken care of, you know, yep. but we're also losing muscle mass in an extremely high rate. And I do want to point out something you said that I think is really important. Um, when you're uh, when you're eating a lot of like, let's say if you're following a vegan diet, and you're eating a lot of plants, you know, you're also when you're you're not getting that meat and saturated fat, that can be just as problematic, in my opinion, as eating a ton of carbohydrates, you know, because you might, depending on your metabolic health, maybe you're young and healthy, you might be able to get away with eating like salads and quinoa and, you know, rice and tofu and all that for a little while. But over time, the human body, like you said, you have to have a species specific diet. You can't cheat nature. You know, nope. it's like you can try and you might be able to get away with it for a little while. But like anything in life, um, it's one of my favorite things about being a, a, a endurance athlete is you know, I, if I want to be a good athlete, I want a good runner. I have to train every single day. You know, I'm, you might only hear about like, oh, Michelle ran this marathon, blah, blah, blah. But it's not like that one day. It is the work every single day. And if you want to be a healthy human, you truly have to nourish your body every single day. And sometimes, like you also pointed out, that means not eating. I am mm-hmm. blown away. 
I can't tell you, Dr. Berry, how many times in the hospital I would see a patient and they would like yell at me. They're like, I haven't eaten since noon. And I'm like, it's like 6.30 p.m. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or like, like, I haven't yeah, eaten since yesterday. Yeah. And I'm like, it's like nine. Like, yeah. you know, but because people are so dependent on those sugars and carbohydrates, we have literally created an industry with Kellogg's and you know, General Mills where people, if they don't eat every hour, they get hypoglycemic. They can't actually access their own stored body fat. Yep. I think that's one of the things about insulin we don't talk enough about. The insulin is a powerful hormone, you guys. Insulin shuts down your body's ability to burn fat. If you're overweight and you decide you're going to eat, you know, cereals and you know, sandwiches and bread, every time you have those carbohydrates, you're telling your body do not burn fat. It switches that shit off. And then you're telling your body burn sugar. Then you have a crash and you feel hungry. You have all this third body fat, but you can't access it. It's almost as if the, your human physiology inside your body doesn't watch television commercials and doesn't <laughs> care who you got a million dollars from. It's going to follow the science and it's going to do what it what it needs to do. It's going to do what it's told to do by your hormones. It's It's really weird, right? Yeah. I mean, that's another great thing is hormones. Like every mm -hmm. piece of food we eat is information. And we have done like the whole calories in, calories out, or it's, it, it all is the same. Like literally, I feel like my, I have a six-year-old niece. I feel like you could be like, hey, Natalie, uh, does this donut make you feel the same as this hamburger? And I feel like she'd tell you no. Like most people yep. know like 300 calories of sugar versus 300 calories of protein or fat. They have dramatically different impacts on the hormonal systems in our body. They are not equal. You know, you, you eat a lot of sugar. It could, you could eat more calories of this protein and fat and lose weight, maintain muscle mass, you know, get your insulin levels normalized where you could eat the same calories of a highly processed sugar diet and have the opposite occur. Yep. One of the, one of the guests on the docuseries, she wasn't losing weight on the scale, but she had paid attention when I told her to buy a Taylor's tape and take mm -hmm. her body measurements. And she said, it's so weird, Doc. I haven't lost a pound on the scale, but I've lost three inches on my, my waist, an inch around my bust, an inch and a half around my hips. Mm. So how's that possible? And I had to explain to her body recomposition because she, she wasn't a, a, a doctor. She didn't know that your body will immediately start to burn fat and make your bones stronger and make your muscles stronger. And those things show up on the scale. So a lot of people doing a low-carb keto uh, carnivore diet, they're like, I'm not losing any weight. This is not working. But if, if they would check their measurements, they're losing inches on a weekly basis as their body makes their bones stronger, which weighs something on the scale. It makes their mm -hmm. muscles stronger, which weighs something on the scale. It's making all their connective tissue, their fascia, their ligaments, their cartilage, their tendons stronger. And that weighs something on the scale. So they definitely aren't burning off a, a, the excess fat, but they're also putting on good, healthy, lean body tissue which shows up on the scale the same way. And, and she was so happy when I explained that to her. It's like, honey, I don't really care if you're losing weight right now, but if your inches are getting better, that means that the, the magic of keto is where an intermittent fasting is working in your body. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, we have a society that is very focused on what do I look like? How much do I weigh? Like you said, I want to look in the scale and see it go, you know, lower. Um, but I think that's a really good point that we need to be talking a little bit more about and, and those are a few things that like, I certainly know as a young person, um, as a very young person, I was not concerned about bone density at all. Like I could have cared less when you're young. And then, you know, unfortunately when I was in my teens, I had a stress fracture and that was my first fracture. I had, you know, you guys, you could read in my, my book, you know, I had an eating disorder. It was pretty, it was pretty bad, but having strong bones, tendons and muscles into elderly, into your later years of life is invaluable. You know, I, I shared that I've seen people work, working in the hospital. I've seen people, you guys, as early as like mid 40s that are so overly fat and so under muscled, they literally can't stand up and walk like two steps to the bathroom. And think about 50s and 60s, people that just maybe are super overly fat. It's called sarcopenic obesity, that they, they, can't, they can't function. They need a caregiver. Um, and then maybe or the opposite. They're so skinny and thin and wiry that if you fall and break a hip, statistically, we know that your, you know, your chances of complete recovery are not good. Yep. And so being able to maintain muscle mass, the best way to do this, well, there's twofold, but I mean, we'll start with, you know, <laughs> I was going to say nutrition, but I'm not even going to go there. Meat. <laughs> you really need animal-based protein. You know, I, 
you could certainly argue, you, some people could say like, oh, I feel like you could do it with the plant-based protein. That is not my recommendation. That is not my advocacy. I haven't seen that work well due to a myriad of reasons. Um, I, I, our, our new, so here's the deal. Our protein recommendations for humans are too low, the, the goofy guidelines. Our carbohydrate recommendations are obviously extend, you know, exponentially too high since technically yep. you need zero. Infinitely then, too high. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of, I was talking to somebody the other day and I said, you know, I feel like we need to, we've confused people with carbohydrates because we say, oh, they're the good and then there's the bad. And so I have diabetics that are like, well, I have a banana because it's fruit and fruit is good. I feel like we're really confusing people. I think yep. we really need to call carbohydrates like cautionary hydrates or so, something to be like, we need a very specific reason to use these. Like, right. oh, Michelle's an ultra runner. Maybe she needs some of these. Oh, you're a growing child. Oh, you had a major burn. But it does, it should not be every human all the time. Like, I feel like we've uh, we've got to change that narrative, you know? Yeah. And that's what I'm hoping that the docuseries will do. I'm hoping that hopefully we'll get enough eyeballs on this and, and people will share it with every friend and family member they know who has prediabetes or type 2 diabetes. And maybe, maybe this is the thing that will tip the scales where it becomes mainstream to know that if you've got high blood sugar, if you've got prediabetes, if you've got type 2 diabetes, uh, carbohydrates, they are dangerous for you. You need to really, really eat a very small amount of them, if any at all. And that's how you're going to not control or manage your type 2 diabetes. That's how you're going to reverse it and get rid of it. Yeah, there is there is still so much myths around carbohydrates. Like I had a dietitian actually a few weeks ago send me an email and say, I, I can't believe you're prescribing a low carb diet or advocating it. The human brain needs 130 grams of carbohydrates to function. And I it was just like, are you do you, can you do a Google search before you like hit me up? Like, can we look at PubMed? Like, I just kind of I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, you guys, I'm, I'm getting frustrated, but Yes, the human brain it does need glucose to function, and it is very capable of making all that glucose from protein and amino acids. It does not need exogenous or you know carbohydrates we take in. And as Dr. Barry pointed out, if you have prediabetes or diabetes, you have a carbohydrate intolerance. You can no longer; they are no longer safe for you. In fact, they are dangerous for you. Yep. So it in be fact, free, they may, may never have been safe for you in the to start with. You might not. So, and, you know, it's really interesting. dangerous now. Yep. We're learning that some people, people have different, you know, and it's part of this, about 10% of this is genetic, but people have different responses to carbohydrates. Some individuals are able to tolerate more than others, but, you know, and it just depends. Some people may not be able to tolerate any at all. You might not be able to have any. You may be fine with 25 grams or less at some point, but if you are sick right now, and unfortunately, 88% of our population is sick. It really is a good idea to consider, should I remove these? And when I say remove these, you know, I, as a young person, I always thought like, oh, diets are, you know, a little salad and a chicken breast. A ketogenic diet is amazing. It is the best, most freeing, fantastic way to eat. You get to eat butter and eggs and steak, and you can have like whatever your favorite, you know, vegetables are. In our house, we, we grew a little bit of squash. Um, and we, you know, we have some carrots and you are full. You don't sit around and be like, oh God, I just ate two hours ago and I'm starving. Is it okay to eat again? It will keep you full for hours. Yep. Like in, in once in the mental clarity, I mean, can you, can you speak a little bit? I'd be curious if, you know, the people in the docuseries, did they say other things than like, you know, how they felt oh, yeah. like more energy and yeah, more energy, more mental clarity. And they were saying about the fourth day in, <clears throat> instead of them saying, isn't it time to eat? They were literally saying, is it time to eat again already? <laughs> literally in four or five yeah. days. And so I think that's just so powerful. I think, and I hopefully, when people are able to watch these real people, they're not actors, they're actual people that we just grabbed out of different states in the country and flew them to Costa Rica and said, let's reverse your type two diabetes. But yeah, the, the definitely um, the, the gentleman said, yeah, it's like my, uh, the, you know, the Visine commercial where everything's cloudy. Hmm. It's like you just pull the, the cloud away and I can just think clearly now. Yeah. And I'm, usually I'm very muddled and muddy and cloudy and I can't think straight. But he said, yeah, just in these four days, I can already think much more clearly. And we heard that from other people as well. So I, I really hope that this docuseries is, is at least plays a role. Yes. Yes. Up enough people that they yell at enough doctors and dietitians and say, I'm sorry, did you just say that my brain needs me to eat 130 grams of carbs a day? Is that what you just said? Mm -hmm. Because 
I heard that we can make all that endogenously and we don't have to eat any. Isn't that true? When enough dietitians and doctors get slapped in the face with a patient who doesn't have a license or a degree, slaps them with the truth and says, are you sure about that? Because I think that's dumb. They'll stop saying that. And when they stop saying it, everybody else will stop repeating it too. And then 10 years from now, we'll all look back and laugh and say, you know, dietitians used to say you needed to eat 130 grams of carbs a day just to feed your brain. They used to literally say that. We'll be like, ha, 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 how ridiculous. Those, those old timers. Yeah, that's coming, but I wanted to get here as quickly as possible. Yeah. Because every day we're losing thousands of grandmothers and grandfathers. Dads are losing legs. Moms are losing their vision. Uh, uncles are going on dialysis. And it's completely preventable. It's completely reversible, not with a pill, not with an injection, but with knowledge of a proper human diet. And I, I just think that's so powerful. I think, I hope, I hope, I pray that that's going to become very popular very soon. I do too. I do too, you guys. And we're going to have, I'm going to make sure a link to where you can, you know, check this out. It's on, it's on GLUED. So it's G-L-E-W-E-D network. And well, we're so having trouble, we're having trouble with GLUED. Okay. Uh, you can actually watch four episodes right now if you go to yourhealthnetwork.com. Okay. Your, your is spelled Y U R. Y U R. All right. So your I'll make sure I get that up. Yeah. Yourhealthnetwork.com. Y U R healthnetwork.com. Y'all make sure you write that down and I'll put that in the notes as well. And, you know, I'm having, I want to really quick address some of the questions um, and just uh, comments we're getting here for the <laughs> thank you. So you bought my book. I appreciate that. Um, so a couple of things, you know, I, I see in the comments, someone says, well, you know, so what about for people like elderly people, people who don't have very strong appetites? And I saw this often in the hospital is sometimes people would only eat one or two meals a day. And my thought was, you know, I often saw elderly people have like toast, oatmeal, a little bit of tea is we've got to then just prioritize the protein and the fat. What are your thoughts, Dr. Barry? Well, I, yeah, I totally think so. And I think if you were to slowly convert them from a high carbohydrate, tea and toast and jelly diet to a more a more ketogenic diet or at least a low carb diet, I think their appetite would actually increase. Mm -hmm. And they would they would actually be able to taste the goodness of that food and they would it would spur them to eat more. In some of the very elderly and very sick, I think a supplement like keto chow shakes and keto chow's soups that you can make with a very healthy animal fat like butter or heavy cream or something like that. If all they want is some sweet drink to, to sip on, boom, there you go. It's sugar free. It's super low in carbs. It's very high in healthy fat and healthy proteins. And you can actually pick the fat that you make it with. And there are other products like that out there, but to give those people insure, which are, is basically a melted milkshake, it's just sugar coma and expect them to in any way be healthier. That's, that's, insanity is it not yeah the, the ingredients of in, an actual insure not the boost suit that i posted but are the, it's literally soy protein canola oil and corn syrup and yeah and lots of sugar from the corn syrup yep yeah it's it's really really bad so yeah i agree you know as people get older a lot of times people tell me like oh i have all these gi problems my stomach hurts when you if you're taking in acids if you're eating a very high carbohydrate diet often you're suppressing stomach acid and you need that stomach acid so i agree hopefully over time you know, by feeding people, you know, these higher protein, higher fat foods, because a lot of the elderly, I mean, that, that might be what they grew up on, but they've gotten away from it because they've been told it's bad and blah, blah, blah. So if we can get back there, I think we're going to have just incredible results. I mean, that's certainly, that's certainly my hope. So um, totally somebody's great. asking about yeah. underweight. Yeah. Like I actually, I have a whole chapter, you guys, in my book on eating disorders. And that is, I actually gave a presentation at Low Carb USA. Mm -hmm. There was a great paper if, on my Instagram. I have a link to it. Um, they actually did the first case study on binge eating disorder and the ketogenic diet. People with lifelong, we're talking 20 plus years binging. They've been through everything. They were all obese. Um, and after a year being followed on a ketogenic diet, symptoms, they had complete remission. Um, they all lost weight up to 24% weight, body fat. And for me, I mean, obviously the remission and binging is huge, but one of the biggest things is they all said they like the symptoms of depression and anxiety, like this lifelong crippling. If anybody watching this and, you know, we're going to share this, if you have an eating disorder, anorexia, bulimia, I had anorexia I, very, very sick when I was much younger, it, you're in chains. It's the worst thing ever. And then when I was weight restored, I still had consistent racing thoughts around food. I was just told that's your lot in life. You're going to have this forever. 
And it wasn't until I adopted this low carb, high meat way of eating that it was just like, oh, it was, if someone had told me, I wish someone had told me when I was a teenager, um, it almost sounds hokey, like, wow, you can actually heal. But like, like you said, when you, when you provide your body, the body has a tremendous capacity to heal. This is like, if you don't yell, hear anything else, y'all, when you give your body the right nutrition and you stop putting things in your body, your body has a, and your mind have a tremendous capacity to heal. So. Absolutely. Uh, I have a hypothesis. Tell me if you disagree with this, Michelle. Sure. I think that one day we'll look back at this period of time, this last 50 years, and we'll say it's quite possible that the highly processed high carbohydrate diet was actually the causative agent for this explosion in eating disorders. Now, obviously, social media, obviously, the glossy magazines, obviously, the, the peer pressure, social pressure play their role maybe a tiny genetic component, but just like you said in the case studies, when you remove the highly processed, high carbohydrate, inflammatory poison and replaced it with real healthy, high fat, high protein keto food, their eating disorder just kind of went away. Yeah. They're, what it, we've been causing these eating disorders with the diet that's been pushed in, in mainstream media and the popular press for the last 30, 40, 50 years, what if that was the, the the primary cause, not the only cause, but the primary mover for all these eating disorders, then what are we going to do? I would love to look back and say that. I'm actually, I had um, Dr. Tro ask me if um, I thought if it would be reasonable to have a clinical trial where we had people with severe anorexia, very underweight, that were either fed like, um, you know, the standard diet or a ketogenic diet. And I said, you're probably going to have trouble with the IRB. I'll, I'll, I'll give my two cents, you know, getting that passed. But I think that would be very interesting because, you know, as I share in my book, like I, they, I was 12, you guys, and they put me on seven different medications because my anxiety was so bad. I mean, because I was being fed to fed 24 hours a day and I was having to eat Lucky Charms in the morning and sandwiches and, you know, all this typical food. And it just, you know, not only is your GI system a mess, but your mind is a mess. It's, it was really hard. So... I, um, and then once, you know, it wasn't until I was an adult and I found this way of eating that my anxiety and everything got so much better. So, and not just eating disorders. I mean, will we look back and say like, wow, major depression, the increase in bipolar disorder and schizophrenia was all because of these highly processed foods. So. Yeah. I'm afraid that that's what we're going to find. And I'm not sure how society is going to extract revenge on the people who were pushing the high carbohydrate crap. I don't, I don't, I hope they have a forgiving heart and there's, you know, not people being burned at the stake when mm -hmm. we truly as a society realize you've been poisoning us for the last 50, 60 years. You've literally been poisoning us. And in many cases, I think at the very upper levels of, of the big food corporations and the, and the big pharma corporations, I think they've got uh, substantial research and they know this to be the case, but the profit model, man, the profit model is so sweet. How are we going? How are we going to give up those profits? And so I don't know what the future is going to hold, but I think it probably won't be boring. <laughs> it definitely won't be boring. I, we had somebody at Low Carb USA ask about uh, a class action lawsuit, and I mean, if that's how the tobacco industry, you know, is taken, they're actually taken on my research under their roof, you know. So yeah. I wouldn't be surprised because every day we find more and more and more. There is no lack of, I mean, even, even lay people can tell you like, yeah, this isn't good for you. But I think just exactly how damaging it is, I think could potentially, like you said, could potentially, are we going to need, are we going to have to have warnings on, on foods? I mean, in my perfect world, we would just ask for eating those foods and, you know, maybe subsidize um, our regenerative agriculture. And um, yeah, I mean, what would your, so what is your solution? Like what, what do you tell people to do? I mean, I kind of know, and I know we've talked a lot about, um, you know, the proper human diet, but you know, if someone says like, look, I'm just, I'm struggling. I'm, I, 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 it's hard to give up processed food. I really like my sugar. Like what would you tell somebody, Dr. Barry? Yeah. I would, I would first ask them a question. What do you love better? Your sugar or, or good health. And if somebody's mm -hmm. never experienced good optimal health, they may not even know that that's, that's an option for them. And then after their answer to that question, I would say step one, remove all sugar from your diet, added or natural. Step two, remove all grains from your diet, even whole grains. Step three, remove all vegetable seed oils from your diet and replace them with animal fats. Step four, eat lots of fatty meat. And step five, watch the docuseries reversed on your health network. And as soon as we get off, Michelle, I'll send you the, the yeah, link. Send me the link. I'll send it to you. And then you can post it with this video. 
And uh, I hope people, if you guys, if you know anybody with prediabetes, metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, or even type 1 diabetes, you could literally ch change the course of their life by sharing this link with them and saying, hey, you need to watch this because I think this is very important. Yeah. And you guys, here's one other thing I want to say. And Dr. Bear, I imagine you're going to agree with me. I know like for me, um, you know, I have family, even people in my own family who are struggle with obesity and other things. Sometimes when you tell somebody something like, hey, maybe you should try this, they're kind of like, eh. but when you if you can say like, wow, oh, you should check out this docuseries, like if they can watch it and see it and they see something else like and just seeing other people change, it can be an entirely different experience. So. Yeah. 100% agree. And that's why I make YouTube videos. And that's why I participated in this documentary, because for some people, that's the way they're going to hear it. They're not going to hear it from their daughter or hear it from their dad. They got to hear it from an independent third source that's on a television screen. Somehow that makes it magically delicious. I don't know why but that's, <laughs> that's just human nature. But thank you so much, Michelle, for having me on. I'll send you that link as soon as we get off and keep Fantastic. doing the great work you're doing. You're growing like gangbusters on social media. <laughs> You Thank should you. be growing faster. I'm trying to help with that. I appreciate that. I'll take any, all the help I can get. It's, it's, it's message, been an amazing yeah, journey. I'm grateful. Your message is, is, is more valuable than money in the bank. So keep doing what you're doing. Don't you ever stop. I won't. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. And you guys, thank you for taking the time. Please share this video. And like I said, as soon as, um, give me about three or four minutes and I'll get that link in, in the show notes. So. Perfect. All right. Thank you, Dr. Barry. Thanks a lot. Bye guys.